Amen. Wasn't that good? Acts chapter 2 this morning. Acts chapter 2. When you don't know the words, you can just smile like Cathead does and everything's okay. It don't matter because that smile settles everything. So I tell you, uh, praise the Lord. And I don't know about y'all, but I'm glad I'm a member of the blood washed band. I'm glad I'm blood bought, blood washed, and it's all by the precious blood of Jesus this morning. It's not by religion. It's not by because I'm a Baptist or a Methodist. It's because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing else can wash away your sin except for the precious blood of Christ. And I pray that you claim that blood upon your heart and soul today. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I want to invite you to stand with me. For the reading of God's word. In verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. Isn't it good when you can gather with folks in this old world and have something in common with other people? Man, how sweet it is. Notice verse 45. And sold their possessions and goods, imparted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Our Heavenly Father, bless the reading of your word. Lord, I pray that you would add to your church today. It's not us, it's you. You're the one that adds to the church. You're the one that saves souls. Lord, it's all about you. And it's all about you adding to your family. It's all about you saving souls and bringing people in for the purpose of serving you. Lord, I pray that you'd add to your church today. Lord, no preacher can add to your church, no program, but only you can add to your church. Only you is who guides these souls and these people together to assemble for the sole purpose of carrying out your great commission. Lord, I want to thank you for letting me be a member of Promised Land Missionary Baptist Church. I'm not ashamed of her. I'm proud to be a member of this church. I don't care what anybody says. I'm glad you brought me here. And I'm thankful for my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm glad that we can come together for one purpose. And that's to serve you. Lord, thank you for the unity that you've given our church. Lord, I pray that you will save souls today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to speak to you this morning on this question. How does God add to his church? How does God add to his church? If you go and you ask that question, depending on who you talk to, depending on the religion that person is from, depending upon the teaching of an individual or upon a church, different people would give you different answers. There's a lot of opinions today on how God adds to his church. But God is God. He instituted salvation. Salvation is not up to us. It doesn't matter what we think salvation is about. God designed salvation. Salvation is up to God. May I tell you, I did, did not create the, the institution of the church. Jesus Christ did. And he bought the church with his own blood. And he gave himself for us. And I want you to know it doesn't matter what I think that the church ought to be or what it is. All that matters is what he thinks today. So the question is, how does God add to his church? And you ask different people, you'll get different answers, but we must go back 
and think, what is a church? And so many people are misled, I believe, on what a church is. And I believe we are misinformed on what a true local New Testament church is. A New Testament church is simply this, a called out local and visible assembly of baptized believers coveted together to carry out the Great Commission. That's the church. Understand when you got saved, you didn't get saved and became a church. You got saved and became a believer. And as that believer, you are to covenant yourself together with other believers to carry out this great commission. The word church in the Greek comes from that Greek word ekklesia, which means a body of citizens summoned together. It's an assembly of people. You cannot have a church without an assembly. A church is an assembly of believers. I want you to know that there's other groups in this town, there's other clubs in this town, and there's assemblies all across this town. You can look at 4-H. You can look at FFA. You can look at all of these different groups. And they are forming an ecclesia. They are forming this assembly of people coming together to carry out the purpose that they have met for. But what differs us apart from any other group or an assembly is the reason that we are coveted together. I want you to know that we're not here for a social group. We're not here... Uh, necessarily just to help the physical well-being of our town, but may I tell you, we have a spiritual purpose here, and we are brought together by Jesus Christ, and we are come together for the purpose of carrying out the Great Commission, preaching and teaching and baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I want you to know that's the job of the church, and every, every assembly in town is different than the assembly of what we're doing here today, and what sets us apart it's not us necessarily gathering. It's the purpose that we're gathering for. If we gather for any other purpose, we're no better than any other group in town and no different. Friend, this is a spiritual purpose. We're here to exalt the name of Jesus. May I tell you, this assembly is different than any other assembly. This is the church. I want you to notice what he said here in verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. I want you to understand there are three actions that take place in this one verse to form the local New Testament church. And you must fulfill these three things to become a part of the Lord's local New Testament church. Notice what it said, number one. They gladly received his word. That's one action. We're baptized is the second action. We're added unto them is the third action. There's three actions that take place. Number one, they received his word. If you are going to be a member of the Lord's church, understand the only way you can do it is through biblical salvation. I want you to notice what it said here in 41. They gladly received his word. The apostle Peter got up in power. He got up and he spoke through the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God and he preached unto those people Jesus Christ in him crucified. And I want you to know that praise God they received the word of God. They applied it to their life and salvation was obtained through receiving and applying the word of God. I want you to understand today that salvation does not necessarily make you a member of the church. But praise God, it definitely makes you a citizen of glory land. It makes you a citizen of heaven. Friend, you can be a citizen of heaven and not be a, a member of the church. But you can also be a member of the church and not be a citizen of heaven. I want you to understand that your church membership will not get you to heaven. Do not rely on your years of service to the church to get your way to glory land. Understand the only way that these people are going to get to heaven is when they took the word of God, they received it and applied it to their life. May I tell you, you cannot go to heaven without true biblical salvation. Who cares what the Baptists say salvation is? Who cares what the Presbyterians say that salvation is? God says that salvation 
salvation is through a personal relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. May I tell you, religion will not save you. Only a relationship with Jesus will save your soul. Do not rely on your church membership to get you to heaven. You rely on your relationship with Jesus to get you there. I want you to know that if you're saved today, you are a citizen of heaven. I don't know about you, but that makes me glad in my heart and in my soul that I know no matter what the devil does today, he cannot take away my citizenship to that city that's coming for me one day. Aren't you glad today you're a citizen of glory land? I tell people sometime when I say, are you saved? And they say, well, I'm a member of so... No, I'm not asking about your church membership. I'm asking about your, your, your eternity. I'm asking about where you're going if you die right now. May I tell you, being a Baptist is not going to get you there. Being a Presbyterian ain't going to get you there. I love when I get on this, y'all get quiet. But I'm telling you, denominational lines will not send you to glory land. It's trusting in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. It's the only way. Jesus said, many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? You know what Jesus is telling us? There's going to be a bunch of church people stand before him and not make it into glory land. I want to make it there. I want to be there before I get anywhere. Amen? I want you to look in Acts 8. Acts chapter 8. Notice in verse 35, Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch. It says, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. May I stop right here and say that you can get any plan and any program you want to, but there is nothing better designed for the purpose of saving souls than the preaching of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. You say, Preacher, I don't like that preaching on the blood and the cross and Jesus. Well, may I tell you in the wrong place this morning. Because that's who we're here to preach and that's who we're here to exalt because that's the only one that can save us today. No Notice what he said. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? In verse 37, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What must I do to be saved? You must admit, number one, that you are a sinner and that you come short of the glory of God. You cannot get saved until you get lost first. You must understand that you have been alienated and you are an enemy with God. And the only way to change that is by you admitting that you're lost and you're in need of a Savior. You must admit that you're a sinner. You say, preacher, that's harsh. Well, let me tell you something. I'm the chiefest of sinners today. There's not one in this place that's above or below sin. Amen? We're all sinners. There's only one that never partook in sin, and his name is Jesus. That's the only one. You must admit you're a sinner, and you must believe on Jesus. Let me tell you something. Other religions call on God. And you can call on God and never truly get to God if you don't call on a son. But may I tell you, when you call on His Son, Jesus Christ, and you believe on Jesus, not only do you get the Son, but you get the Father. And Jesus said you can get to Him, and you can go to Him all you want to, but you're not going to get there unless you go through Me. Jesus said, I'm the Father of one. If you've received Jesus as your personal Savior, and you believe on Him, don't believe on your baptism, don't believe on your church membership, don't believe on anything else but Jesus. You believe on Him, and then you confess Him as Savior. You call out, and you pray, and you ask God to save your soul. May I tell you, that's the only way to be saved. There's no other way to get to heaven without admitting you're a sinner, believing on Jesus, and confessing Him as Savior and Lord of all. It's the only way to be saved. If you've never done that today, you must be saved today. Being a church member will not send you to heaven. Admitting, believing, and confessing will send you to heaven. May I tell you, I'd rather be a member of heaven than anything else in the world. I'd rather be a citizen for that city than a citizen of the United States of America. And man, if you don't have your reservation punched today, if you don't have that reservation made, you need to make it right here today. Are y'all with me this morning? 
How does God add to his church? Number one, through biblical salvation. Number two, through scriptural baptism. Notice what it said. Then they that gladly received his word, there's an action, were baptized. Here's another action. They received the word, they got saved, and then they received scriptural baptism. Understand that receiving and baptism is a separate action. Being baptized is a separate action from being saved. You cannot be baptized in order to get saved. Most of these kids that come in, they're just naturally, they say, Preacher, I need to be baptized so I can go to heaven. I need to be baptized so I can go to heaven. When I ask people about salvation out and about and I begin to witness to people, about 50% of them will bring up their baptism for salvation. Understand they were saved and they were baptized. There was two separate actions that took place. They received and then they followed Jesus in scriptural baptism. May I tell you, if you're going to be added to the church, you must be biblically saved and you must be scripturally baptized. Understand that in Matthew 3.15, Jesus said, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus said, if you want to follow me and please the Father, you must do what I'm doing. Did Jesus need to be saved? I'll, well, one of the kids got that right. No. <laughs> Jesus did not need to be saved. He was salvation. So he didn't need to be baptized in order to be saved. But understand that Jesus was starting his earthly ministry. And before he ever performed a miracle, before he ever went out and healing and teaching and doing all these things, he was baptized. Being baptized started his earthly ministry. May I tell you that when you get saved, you are to follow Jesus in baptism. You must do this to fulfill all righteousness. You say, preacher, I don't want to be baptized. Well, if you want to be like Jesus, you're going to have to be baptized. Jesus was baptized. And if it was good enough for him... It's good enough for us. He said you must do this to fulfill all righteousness. May I tell you that we are commanded as God's people to follow him in scriptural baptism? You need to be baptized. Understand what scriptural baptism is. Number one, it's an act of obedience. It will not save your soul, but it is the act of you following the Lord. If you get saved and you say, what do I need to do to follow God? The first thing you do is get baptized. You follow the Lord in scriptural baptism. Yes, it does not affect your eternity. But may I tell you, it opens the door for your life of service. If you want to serve God and you want to get on fire for God, you follow Jesus in scriptural baptism. You go to the water for Him. Boy, y'all got quiet this morning. Y'all don't quit on me. But let me tell you something this morning. There's a lot of people who say, I got saved, I got saved, I got saved. But they never follow Jesus in scriptural baptism. Every Everywhere in the scripture, Brother Allen, where they got saved, they straightway went to the water and followed Jesus in scriptural baptism. If you want to walk the way that God wants you to walk, you must be baptized. You must be baptized. Understand that baptism is an act of obedience. But not only is it an act of obedience, but it is being fully immersed. Understand that when Jesus got baptized, he went all the way under. And you say, well, preacher, I don't really believe. It don't matter what you believe. Jesus went all the way under. The Greek word baptized means to be fully immersed. It means to go all the way under. I'm not here to down any religion. I'm not down here uh, to down your baptism. I'm not here to do that. But I'm here to tell you that if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for us. Let me tell you something. Baptism is a picture of your salvation. And when Jesus saved you, he didn't sprinkle you with salvation. I'm not trying to be cute. I'm trying to be serious. He didn't just halfway saved you. He saved you all the way. You went all the way under for the Lord. Amen. And God saved you all the way. And may I tell you that when Jesus got baptized, he went all the way under the water and he come back up. The Bible said he straightway come out of the water. May I tell you, if he went all the way under, you need to go under too. And I need to go under too. You say, preacher, where I was raised, we didn't teach that. Listen, I'm not here to down your teaching and your raising, but I know Jesus went all the way under. And like I said, if it's good enough for him. Bless God, it's good enough for us. Amen? And it is a picture of showing people that we've gone all the way under for the Lord. 
Aren't you glad he didn't halfway save us? He all together bought us and redeemed us and saved us. You say, well, you're on that Baptist doctrine. Friend, that's Bible doctrine right there. He went all the way under for the Lord. But it's all, all also done by the right authority. When Jesus got baptized, he didn't just go find anybody to baptize him. He went to the one that God gave the authority to. Who did he give the authority to? John the Baptist. And he gave John the Baptist the authority. And I want you to know that Jesus could have gone to anybody, but he went to the very one that God gave the authority to. And the authority was there in John the Baptist. Jesus could have dunked himself. Lord, have mercy. He had all the authority in the world. But he's trying to teach us that when you truly get saved, you follow him in baptism, and you don't just go anywhere. You go to where that authority is given. It matters who baptizes you. Amen? It matters where you get baptized. Understand that this is done and the structure of the church is put together to protect the Lord's church and to protect His New Testament church. I want you to know for the last three or four years there in Wells, Texas, I battled this cult and I battled these young people coming in who got away from the authority of the church and they went out on their own authority and understand they are brainwashing people and they are doing all of these things, it's never good to get away from the authority of the church. Amen? And Jesus said in the Great Commission, I have this authority. I'm giving it to you. Now you go and you teach and you baptize. Amen? It matters who baptizes you. You've got to be baptized from the church that has the authority given to them by Jesus Christ. Oh man, y'all are quiet today, but that's good preaching to me. <laughs> Number four, it's the answer of a good conscience. 1 Peter 3, 21, The light figure whereunto even baptism doth also save us, not putting away the filth of the flesh, listen now, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. Understand that baptism is about your conscience. It's about you following the Lord. It's about you serving God. And may I tell you, if you get up there with the conscience that that baptism is going to help you get to heaven, your baptism was not right. If you got up there with the mindset of false doctrine and that Jesus was going to save you through the waters or the people that baptize you, baptize you with the mindset that this is going to help you get to glory land, it's wrong. It's the answer of a good conscience towards God. Understand that we must be right in our mind and be right in our hearts. And our hearts must be pure and we must have the right motive in order to receive true baptism. Not only us, but the ones that are baptizing us. It does matter. I've heard it over and preacher. It don't, yes, it does matter. If it didn't matter, he wouldn't tell us how to do it. Amen? He told us how to do it, and we must do it his way. Notice number three. Through scriptural baptism and through church membership. Notice the third action here in Acts chapter 2. In verse 41, And they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Notice the third action here. They were saved, they were baptized, and they were added to the church. Church membership is simply the action of a saved and scripturally baptized believer submitting themselves to a local assembly of baptized believers covenanted together to carry out the great commission. Here's the third action. They got saved, they were baptized, and they submitted themselves to the local church. They submitted themselves to the local church. Now I want you to notice what it said in verse 47. And the Lord added to the church. Notice in verse 41, and there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. How does God add to the church? God is who brings us together. There was a time that I was to be at First Baptist Church in Wells, Texas. There was a time that I was to be at Hyde Park in West Monroe, Louisiana. And then there was a time that God said, you need to go to promised land. The Lord made that decision, not me. Amen? God makes the decision. And I'll tell people who visit all the time, we love you and we want you here. But only if God wants you here. The Lord adds to the church. The member, the, the, the believer that is baptized is to submit himself to the leadership of God.
And when God leads to a local assembly, that believer is to be obedient to God and submit himself to the authority of that church. I know this is not popular. I know in the world in which we live today, there is no order in the church, but there must be order in the church. The Lord adds into the church. I want you to look in Acts chapter 1. And so the question arises, is it necessary to join a local assembly? Is joining a church role biblical? Is having this church membership and role, is it even biblical? I want you to notice in Acts 1, if you were ever taught that the church was started on the day of Pentecost, this will show you that it wasn't. It was started during the ministry of Jesus Christ. He's the head of the church. Before Pentecost ever got here in verse 15, they were gathered together. <laughs> They were ha fixing to have a business meeting. <laughs> well, like them, do we? But they're fixing to have a business meeting. Notice what it said in verse 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of names together were about 120. They knew how many they had, and they knew who they had. There was order to this church. There was structure to this church. It was not chaos. God is not the author of confusion. Amen? I want you to look over here, back in our text. And there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. A little later, there was added unto them about 5,000 souls. How did they know how many they had? Because it was in order. And they had record of every one of them. They had record of their profession. They had record of their baptism. And they had record of their submission to the local church. That God had called them to this place to serve. Understand that the church of Jerusalem is having this big evangelistic rally. The Holy Spirit of God is coming down. And people from 18 different nationalities is here. And souls are getting saved like crazy. And as they're getting saved, they're getting baptized. And they're being added to the church. And as they join this church, understand they do what a New Testament church is supposed to do. They tell them to go. They send them back to Rome. They send them back to all of these other countries and all these other cities on that authority that they had from that church in Jerusalem to go start more churches. And by the way, if you don't say amen for that, something's wrong because this is how we have a church right here today. Is because those people got saved, they got baptized, and they joined this church, and they followed the command of Jesus when he said go. Go, go, go. Is it biblical? Is this assembly, is this role biblical? Well, that's what they had in the early days. That's what they had then. Follow me and I'm going to be done. Hebrews 13. I read an article the other day on a man by the name of Matt Chandler who pastors a big mega church in South uh, Dallas at Village Church. And he went there years ago. He built it up, big mega church, awesome things going on. When he got there, they had no membership. They had no role. They had nothing like that. He said it was chaotic. But he said in the church in which he was raised, that was okay. And he said in this that God began to teach him some things. He said, I understood the church universal, but I didn't know the church local. And this scripture right here is what began to change his heart about this. It says in verse 17, Obey them that have rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Verse 17 is the role of a believer and an overseer. Okay? When he got to this verse, God began to convict him. It says, obey them that have rule over you. He said, I'm in Dallas. Who, as believers, do we need to submit ourselves to as overseers? He said, there's hundreds, maybe thousands of overseers in Dallas, Texas. He said, are we to submit to every one of them? Who are the believers to submit to if you don't believe in that local assembly? And he turned this around. He said, as a pastor, notice what he said, submit yourselves for they watch for your souls that they must give account. He said, i got to give an account as an overseer. Who do I give an account for? Do I give an account for every, uh, every believer in Dallas, Texas? No. 
And this is where God began to form the organization of the local church in his heart and mind. And he began to understand that without this organization and without this, there's no submission to the local church. Who am I as pastor of Promised Land Missionary Baptist Church to give an account for? Am I to give an account to those that don't sit under this teaching? That doesn't sit under here and doesn't follow uh, what we're doing here at Promised Land? I can't give an account for them. But I will give an account to each and every one of you. And for each and every one of you. And who, as a believer, are you to submit to every teaching of every preacher because they come as a preacher? No. You're to do the one that God placed in front of you. God led me here. Amen? Amen. Boy, I'm telling you, we don't get a lot of amens on that. But God led me here. I'm not here to be your dictator. I'm here to teach you in the Scripture. And you're to submit to that teaching because God led you here and He led me here. And we are to submit to one another. And so many times we can't submit to the local church. We can't submit to the authority of Christ because we're this big rebel and, and we want to go do it our way. That's what forms cults. That's what forms false religion. That's what happened in Waco. That's what happened in all these other places. And it's going to continue to happen if we don't follow that structure right there. That's what happened. I want you to notice this. I want you to go to Ephesians 4. If Brother Trey can go over, by George, I can too. <laughs> Ephesians 4. I'm almost done. I've been telling you that for 10 minutes. Ephesians 4. Notice what he said in verse 4. Because this is a scripture we always hear. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. Now go down to verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth, now here's the purpose, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man cunning craftiness <clears throat> whereby they lie in wait to deceive us. May I tell you we need some stability in our spiritual life. Notice what he said, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head even Christ. Now here it is. From whom the whole body fitly joined together. Oh this is beautiful. And compacted by that which every joint supplies. This is every member submitting themselves together by the authority of Christ, coming together, forming that body that He has called us to be, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part. Every part has got to be working. Amen? We need the nose. We need the toes. We need the fingers. Every part of the body has got to come together. Maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. There's nothing more beautiful than believers assembling themselves with other believers, submitting themselves to the authority of Christ, and submitting themselves to the authority of the church. May I tell you, if you are saved today, it would do you well to follow Jesus in scriptural baptism. May I tell you, it would do you well to join the local New Testament church. You say, how do I know when I need to join? God adds to the church. You follow the leadership of the Lord. You follow what He tells you to do. And when you become a member, listen to me, I don't want to lose you, all eyes up here. When you become a member, you join in full fellowship to the church. There are blessings of being a part of the Lord's local New Testament church. It is a blessing to be part of Promised Land Missionary Baptist Church. If you are visiting, if you are a member of another church, if God is leading you to this place, then you need to join. And you need to follow the Lord and let the Lord use you right here if that's what God's leading. I want everybody in this place to be a member. Of I, I could go to Hamburg and beg everybody to come. But it's not in God's will that everybody comes. And I've had to learn that God adds to the church, not me and not you. God does this. This is a God thing. We get saved. We get baptized. 
And then we become a member of the church. You know what it said in verse 40, whatever there in Acts? They join together in doctrine, in teaching, breaking of bread, and they were in one accord. Isn't it sweet when the local church is working together? Christ died for us. Christ bought us. And it's about His way and it's about His plan. It's His, it's his church. We've got to do it His way. If you're here today and you've never been saved, you must admit, you must believe, and you must confess. I want you to run down this aisle right now. Let me show you how to be saved. If you're here and you've never been saved, be saved right here today. If you've been saved and you've never followed Jesus in scriptural baptism, you need to be saved. It matters how you were baptized. It matters. And if you've never done it His way, I want to encourage you to do that today. And if God is leading you here, you need to join this church. May I tell you that you will join in full fellowship to the church. And you will receive the privileges of being a member. I don't know about y'all, but God's will is perfect. And He's got us all here together. It's amazing to me, Brother Trey resigned. God's lifted up a youth director. <laughs> Brother Trey resigned, and he's brought us two computer guys. <laughs> and everything that we lost in Brother Trey, God multiplied, and God added. And we all come together for the purpose of this edifying of this body. That Jesus can be glorified. And Jesus can be seen. It don't matter what I think. All that matters is what He thinks. And, and all that matters is the authority that He has given to this church. Are you willing to submit yourself today? I want to ask you to stand very quiet, very reverent. And as she plays, you come. If you need to come, be saved. Be saved today. If you need to come to these altars, come. If you need to come to be baptized, come. If you need to join this church today, you come today. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Believers, if you're where you need to be, I want you to pray. I want you to ask the Lord to save souls in this place today. Whatever your need is, would you come?